Hello! It is a very cold night here in Florida, so I have my little blankie on, and I decided to, um, you know, after I was done coaching uh, someone on uh, Discord, which I do offer coaching, by the way, check out the uh, YouTube join membership button, by the way, for that, um, I decided to make a complete masterclass video, um, that way that you guys can understand the basics and even some more of the more uh, nuanced plays of Sakazuki and you know whenever I coach someone in the future we can build upon that and talk about plays and you know uh, turn sequencing and, and, and things like that optimal plays um, and we can more fine-tune that rather than talk about the basics in our sessions so um, I have prepared for you a very long masterclass video slide by slide breaking down exactly what to do into some of the most prominent matchups and just playing Sakazuki in general, but first I want to say that if you are participating in our tournament or haven't heard about our tournament, we actually changed it from December 23rd to December 30th. It is a cash prize PayPal webcam tournament that is going to be, you know, officially you know, judged. You know, we have official judges on there. Um, it's going to be through webcam. Everyone can join. And then obviously, um, I talked about this in, in other videos, but we have thousands of dollars in prize support. Um, if we get 80 people, um, that is our threshold, which, which I believe we're going to go way past that at this point. Um, but if we get m double 80 people, obviously we'll double the prize support. And, you know, obviously the more people that we get from, you know, for f the more people that we get, the better the prize pool will be. So check out the description for our Discord link below. Um, and yeah. That's that's for the tournament. And before we start the video, also I want to say, um, if you if you are brand new to this channel and you're wondering why should why should you listen to me, well I have these two guys right here, which is a Serial Shanks and a Treasure Cup Zora, which I know you know if you're a good player you probably have one of these as well. Um, so it's not too impressive, but you know it gives me at least a little bit of merit to talk about you know advanced plays because I obviously was able to get there. Um, I haven't played in a whole lot of tournaments. Um, you know, I played under, I, I think a total of seven and I got this on my sixth try, um, which was great. So, um, I know what I'm talking about and, uh, I'd love to teach you more about One Piece and Sakazuki in general, because I think this deck is really fun if it draws well. Um, but I will say the only thing that this deck loses to, um, consistently is itself. So... What I mean by that is I'm going to make a very long video explaining everything there is to know about Sakazuki, for the most part. Um, hopefully I don't miss anything. And I and you can still lose a lot of games by just not drawing counter or not drawing cost minusers when you need to be drawing cost minusers or, you know, hound blaze when you need to draw hound blaze. Sometimes the deck is very inconsistent. Sometimes you don't draw counters. Sometimes you don't draw KO stuff. Sometimes you don't draw Hina. It happens, right? So this is a deck very similar to Red Green Law, where if you don't draw the cards you need to draw, you can lose games. It's just that simple. It doesn't matter how good it doesn't matter how good you are at the game, sometimes you just get unlucky. So with that being said, let me go into the deck list that I am going to run for the most part. And I came up with this list because I am tired of losing to no counters. So I'm playing as many draw cards as I possibly can. Um, we are playing, you know, obviously this is way different than the, the list I posted a while ago because we are playing now to Hina for the draw. We're playing to Sabo for the draw. We're playing to Kuzan for the draw, as well as obviously it's just good into certain matchups. And we're playing to Kaido for the draw. So hopefully with this along with the leader effect we are not going to brick in the games so i haven't tried this specifically yet but i've tried a ton of different variants of sakazuki i'm sure this one's probably really good as well um it's playing all the core cards just you know different ratios of certain cards so um, with that being said let's get into the main part of the video so uh right here let me make my camera just a little bit smaller so we can talk about this um and let me push it off over here actually i can make it bigger uh, so you guys can see my beautiful face can you please okay there we go and I can make it bigger and we can talk about maybe that's a little bit too big we can talk about the game okay so that's the last slide so don't don't pay attention to that so this is the ideal starting hand for Sakazuki okay um, now it is I put three of these obviously this is way more than five right but I put three of these because 
um, these can be replaced based on matchup. So either a Lucci or a Borsalino or a Cruzan, one of the four costs. Obviously, you want to go second. And these four cards as well. So, brand new is the engine of the deck. Great Eruption helps cycle as well as cost minus. And then Hound Blaze can pretty much just get you into the mid game because it's, you know, can get rid of pretty much any problem card in the game, especially in the early game. Because with this and your leader effect, that's a five cost um, to be able to bottom deck with Hound Blaze. And then a 2k counter, it could be Tashigi, it could be Tasuru, it could be Bartolomeo, just whatever it is you prefer. And yeah. That, that's great right there. Obviously, playing the brand new gets you into your Luchi engine a lot faster, and you'll have three cards. Um, however, with Luchi, it's best not to bottom deck cards that you can recycle later. For example, the three some of the best targets to recycle or to put back in the bottom of your deck with Luchi are these three cards in the middle, Hound Blaze, Great Eruption, and Brand New, because Mon Cherie and Rebecca can get back a, um, a three to a five and a three to a seven. None of these fit that description. All right, even Tasuru, you can put Tasuru, the 2k counter, back into your uh, bottom of your deck because it's not recyclable, and those are your targets with Luchi. Now, cards that you need to discard off your leader effect. Now, there's a lot of them because there's different scenarios where you need to discard them, and I'll explain that for the most part. You know, obviously, uh, full breakdowns if you have more questions, you know, check out my coaching or whatever. So, all of these, with the exception of one, as you can see, are all three to seven cost black characters that can be recycled off of Maud Cherie or Rebecca with the, with the exception of Rebecca because Rebecca cannot recycle itself. But sometimes, sorry, that was probably really loud. <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, but sometimes this Kaido right here is a very dead card. This is a great card into matchups like yellow. Right. And some and, you know, obviously in the mirror match, it's great. However, if you're playing a, against a deck like Whitebeard or sometimes Purple Luffy, sometimes you just don't have access to this because you're too low of life to be able to play it safely. But when you can play it safely, it's great. If not, you discard it off your leader effect. Obviously, against Purple Luffy, you discard this off your leader effect. Or if you're in a pinch, you can discard, you know, if you if you really need to dig for like a Hound Blaze or something like that, something to help you in, in the current turn, you can discard your Tasu your uh, Tashiki and your Bartolomeo or, you know, Rebecca. All of these are recyclable with either Rebecca or Mon Cherie, right? So discarding them isn't too, too horrible um, because you're able to get them back potentially later on. So, um... Obviously, there's certain, like, scenarios where you keep them, and so there's certain scenarios where you don't keep them. All of that depends on the matchup, which we're not going to talk about too much in this slide right here. But cards to counter out with. It's the same philosophy, cards that you can bring back later on. Bartolomeo, Tashigi are the two ones you mainly want to counter out with. Tasuru is one you'd rather keep in hand. If you have the option of countering out with a Tashigi or a Tasuru, for those of you guys who don't know, Tasuru looks like this, this guy right here. Um, then you counter out with the Tashigi instead because this is recyclable, right? And Tasuru, if you are without Great Eruption, Tasuru is the same cost and the same cost minus, which is two, um, that can get you to where you need to be cost-wise to remove something from the board. Obviously, uh, Rebecca and Borsalino, you can bring them back later on with Monchery or just Rebecca. Um, here are matchups we don't like, and... I will say this, the only reason we put uh, Katakuri and, I'm sorry, the only reason that we put Katakuri and Nell on here um, is because they are luck-based decks that can win the game by high-rolling you and getting lucky. So no one ever wants to see Katakuri or Nell across from them, ever. I don't even care if you're, if you're favored into that. I mean, maybe maybe Newgate wants to see Katakuri, but Newgate sure as hell doesn't want to see Nell. Pretty much no one wants to see Yellow across the table because they are a luck-based for the most part, skillless, brain-dead decks that can and will beat you randomly from triggers like Beige and Brule and Sanji and uh, Thunderbolt and all of these cards. So uh, no one ever wants to see that, so that's why we call them matchups we don't like. Whitebeard is a matchup we potentially don't like because, obviously, um, it can play a lot of rush characters to rush you down and tempo you out of the game um, and obviously, you know, have multiple turns where it can just stall with Rad Beams and Marcos or something like that. Um, that's potentially scary. I'm not saying it's a it's a it's, I'm not, not 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 saying it's a bad matchup uh, per se, which I mean sometimes it is depending on you know draws, but it's a very scary matchup, which is why we call it matchups we don't like. 
Um, same with Captain Kid. This is a random one. You're like, Kid? What's going on with Kid? Uh, Kid can double swing 12K. And for those of you guys who remember earlier in the video, what I said is we have a lot of dead cards in our hand for the most part. I mean, look at this starting hand right here. We got Luchi's dead, Kuzan's dead, Great Eruption's dead, Houndblaze is dead. All these cards are dead. So if you run out of gas with Kid and you're like, well, I got nothing left. Let me just go 12-12. I mean, we don't have a lot of answers for that, especially because they can play cards that rest other cards like Punk Gibson or Nekamamushi or Izo or Yamato or, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, the blockers that we have that we think are safe, like, you know, Borsellino or even Rebecca, they're not safe. They can rest them and they can go 12-12 and uh, yeah, they can kill you. So it's a matchup we don't really like, um, but we can win it, obviously. All of these matchups are winnable. Um, it's just we don't like seeing them. So uh slide five interesting plays so i think i've talked about this in another video but mon Cherie has an infinite loop with rebecca where if they only have their leader and nothing else on the board which is easier uh to do than you might think because obviously you have a lot of removal in this deck then when you turn mon Cherie sideways to tap her and use her effect you can get back the rebecca rebecca can get back hina and hina can be played for free obviously and then the next turn if they play something you remove it if they attack the Monchery, you block with rebecca next turn you tap Monchery, you do it all over again you play rebecca you get a hina yada 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 right it's the same exact play over and over again if they have no other way of removing this character it is a free infinite loop blocker every single turn and you're pretty much never going to die right so um unless they get lucky like category can get lucky with thunderbolt and Parasparrow and things off life so that's that all right. Another thing is now I know I said earlier that Hina is the go to card to discard off of life or uh, out of your hand, which for the most part is true. However, there is an exception to that. Um, let's say you have a Hina in hand and you really need a 2K counter. Now you could use your leader effect to discard the Hina and probably try to find a 2K counter. Or what you can do is you can play Rebecca get a 2k counter, which is Tashigi or Bartolomeo out of the trash, or Virgo if you play Virgo, and then you can play the Hina from hand. It's the same exact play, because obviously you're going to be playing Rebecca to essentially be playing a Hina for cost reduction, except in this case, you're not getting back the Hina to play it, you're getting back the Tashigi to play it, or same principle, if you have Hina in hand, but you don't have Luchi, you can play Rebecca, grab back the Rob Luchi, play the Hina from hand, all right? Whatever you need, this is like a generic engine to play. You don't always have to discard Hina. Sometimes it's best to keep it in hand. That's why I put on this little, you know, text right here. It depends on what's in hand to make the most optimal play, especially because sometimes at 10 Dawn, you know, you can just hard play the Hina and then you can play your, um, well, I guess he's not on here right now, but your Borsellino, your, uh, your, your Borsellino, your, your seven cost Borsellino. That way you can kill with your leader. Um, a nine cost, which is either like Newgate or, you know, uh, something along those lines, Rush Kaido, something, something like that. Right. So that is the combos with Rebecca. Um, you don't always have to discard Hina, but you know, obviously, you know, in the very beginning, it's usually best to do so. And then Rebecca can fish it out of the trash and recur it later. But if you already have Hina in hand, sometimes if you're already going to be playing Rebecca that turn, it's best to, uh, sometimes keep it in hand and get back like a 2k or a Luchi if that's what you need by taking out by by discarding the Hina too early sometimes you can you know play, play Rebecca get back the Hina from trash and realize oh wait I don't have Luchi so maybe trashing this was a mistake and now I actually can't KO the card and you're probably going to lose from there uh, Sakazuki is a deck that if you if you make one mistake you are likely going to lose it is a deck that is always kind of on a, a very thin line because it's very similar to law uh, red green law where none of the characters really do a whole lot on their own minus like borsalino seven cost and then 10 cost kaido everything else is always working in conjunct in conjunction with other cards so if you play the rebecca combo and you know cost minus with hina and then don't ko something or miscount you know how much you know you know what what cost they're at then obviously your hound blaze is no longer a thing and your board is very easy to crack because ideally on paper it's just a 5k attacker and a blocker it's like not very scary board but when that 5k attacker and blocker turn into a board wipe that's 
way more scary. And on top of the board wipe, now we have a Luchi and a Hina on board with a blocker. That sounds much more scary than Hina blocker pass, right? It's just not, it's not really that scary at all. So be very careful with when you're discarding Hina. Be very careful when you're discarding Luchi. All of these cards that I talked about earlier to cards to discard off effect, you have to be careful when you're discarding them because if you're playing against Whitebeard, and you're discarding this to try to find something else, like for example, you're discarding this to try to find like a Luchi. Well, sometimes you need this to be able to, you know, deal with their like 7K attacks or even just to have a blocker for the end of the game. So um, you have to decide what's more important in that situation. And if you are to discard this and don't find what you're looking for, are you completely dead in the water? So that's that. Let's talk about specific examples of what we need to play against. So against Purple Luffy. We're going to talk about some of the titans in the meta. Purple Luffy, Pluffy, Pluffy, however you want to call it. That deck, you always, always, always counter out of their first attack. Because if you are going second, which Purple Luffy always wants to go first, if you're going second, if they swing five at life, you take it. You're at seven cards in hand. All right? Unless you, like, whiff off brand new or something like that. But you got seven cards in hand. They use their leader effect. They go to four dawn. They play the law. You're discarding two cards from hand. Every, every time. Right? It's either it's either this or they're going to play page one. Don't play into this because there's a chance it takes out a very important card from your hand. Which could be Houndblaze and, uh, and uh, Great Eruption. Which we talked about is an ideal starting hand. If they take these ca two cards out of your hand... Well, now it's a pretty bad hand. It's not anywhere close to what it could have been. So always, always, always counter out of the first attack. And then try to just keep a hand size below seven anyway. The only time you, can, the only time you can't really avoid that is if you're playing Kaido, the 10 cost Kaido. Um, and then you're going to draw four and probably be at seven. So no way to really play around that. But hopefully they just don't have it at that point. Or if they do play this, it's just not the right play. So that's that. Another another card, all the other scary cards to look out for are Magellan, Polly, and Kaido. Against again, or we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. But and then and then Top Knot is also a tech that they're playing because with the uh, five cost blocker kid, the Top Knot is a cost two Dawn minus. I'm sorry, it's a cost one Dawn minus one essentially because with the blocker kid, they get back a Dawn as active. So it's a one cost essentially one cost minus one event that bottom decks a four or less to the owner's deck so this can be put used against your kuzan against your borsalino this could be used against a uh, hina rob Lucci, a lot of stuff so this is a very dangerous card i would be very careful with this card um it's 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 very scary um obviously you know it's not the greatest of cards but you know it is a tech card that people do not expect so just be on the lookout for that also for magellan you want to see these specific cards. I'm sorry, not Magellan. Uh, for Purple Luffy. You want to see these specific cards. You want to see Houndblaze and Great Eruption for Magellan. And you want to see Ice Age and Borsalino for Kaido. Or, you know, Ice Age and whatever it is. Something to get to the cost of KOing a 9 or less. Removing a 9 or less off the board. Because those are the two scariest cards that they have. You're not really too worried about Kid. Because he's a very slow card. Like yeah there'll be a 6k leader for a turn. But after that you can usually remove it. Especially because it's a 7 cost character. So you're not too concerned about Kid. Obviously Kid can also be met with Borsalino. And like a great eruption. You know obviously in, in, in combination with leader effects. So um, you're not too worried about that. You're worried about cards that can pretty much impact the game right away which is the Magellan and the Kaido also you never ever ever play Kuzan in this matchup he is a dead card you discard him every chance you get there is no exceptions they can answer it with Polly and Rampadon they can answer it with Top Knot for one Dawn they can answer it with Kaido and then get gain ten thousand gain a ten thousand rush character. There's just a lot of stuff that they can do to basically remove this. And the you're like, well, it replaces itself. Sometimes there's just a better play. Sometimes if they if like a Borsalino and pass is a better play than Kuzan and pass because they get value from popping a Kuzan. All right, even if it sticks on the field, which is very unlikely that it will happen. Like, it's, it's very short-lived. If you don't use it that same turn, then you're worried the next turn. 
well, they didn't pop it that turn. They might have the, you know, the poly this time, or they might have Kaido this time or top knot or something like that. This card is not going to stay on the field for very long. So don't even bother wasting your time playing it. Discard it every single time. Never play it. All right. Unless, I, unless there's no other options. And then I guess fine, whatever. Um, against a Nell. So give them life. Every time they play the Charlotte Linlin, it doesn't matter. Just give them life. Enel is a deck that revolves around card advantage much more than Katakuri. So obviously, Katakuri, you don't want to give them life because, you know, it's harder for them to recur life than decks like decks like Enel or Queen. But against Enel, it is much easier um, to, like, you always want to... Okay, let me be more articulate on this. When they play this character, it's better to give them life because you usually want to leave them at two life either way. And most of the time, you're not even attacking, right? When the second I get an L to two life, especially in like the early to mid game, I'm not attacking for the rest of the game because it leaves these two cards live and they gain value from it. For example, Yamato and 10,000 million volts or whatever you call it, 200 million volts, Amaru. They both activate when they have one or less life. So why would I give them value off these cards to be able to rest my characters and then gain life? It just doesn't make any sense. So giving them life in the grand scheme of things is much better than you trashing a life because especially with a, with a Sakazuki, you only have four life to begin with. That's four cards to be able to get you from early game, start of the game to the end of the game. If you somehow go from four life to three life and don't get that resource to hand well now you're playing a three life leader now you're playing purple red purple luffy instead of a four life leader so it's just that one card could be the card you need it could be a great eruption hound blaze it could be a borsalino it could be a lot of cards that you might need to be able to end this to be able to get this game underway and by trashing life you won't have it um, obviously I, we already talked about Yamato and 2 million volts of Maru. The only exception for both of these are at the very end of the game. If you need to, them to be at one life to go for game the following turn, then I guess it is okay to leave them at one life. Um, but in the early to mid game, or I guess the mid game, I guess, cause it would be at what nine dawn the mid game. If they are at one life, they're almost certainly have either this or like Katakuri. So, um, they're just going to get free cards pretty much either way. So, um, don't leave at uh, one life unless you have to, and if you leave them at one, if you leave them at one life, especially when you're running low on life or hand size, you are getting, you are risking them just amaruing your board and going for game, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, play around the things that you can play around, and try to win the game based on what you can control. That's my best advice. All right. Also, be sure to play around this Gadatsu and Kuzan. If they attack <laughs> if the anel player they always usually want to go first by the way if the anel player does not attack your life for like multiple turns it means they have this in hand and they're waiting to get value from it however if they if you if 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 you're at the four dawn turn and you play this kuzan do not be surprised if it gets gadatsu they're like you're like well I wonder why they weren't attacking my life. It's obviously they had that in hand. Like it, it's like it's easier to read than a kindergartner's like notebook. Like <laughs> cat, dog. Like yeah, you could read that pretty easily, right? Same with Gadatsu, right? Now obviously they're gonna change plays if you play a, for example, a Borsalino blocker. They're going to change from Gadatsu to, for their turn three play for five dawn to Ohm and Holy, which is totally fine. Because, you know, that's more, I mean, it's still, it's not fine either way. Because either one of them is going to pop them, pop a card. The other one is going to just establish two bodies that are kind of annoying to get off the board. Um, but I'd rather them establish two bodies than take away one of my characters that I spent my entire turn playing uh, the previous turn. So um, there's that. And then also, don't forget about El Thor. El Thor, for those of you guys who don't know, is a reverse rad beam that when you yourself have two or less life, then your opponent, when they activate this card, gains plus 4,000. Normally, it's a 2,000 counter. Um, it's very similar to rad beam, but if your opponent has two or less life, that's when the El Thor activates. So please be careful and play around this card. 
because it can surprise you. I know it, it has surprised me in my early times playing against a nil. And I'm like, what the hell does this do? I'm, they left one dawn open. I'm playing around a Nakama arrow and I put 3000 over a character and they played Thor and I was like, well, damn, that sucks. So yeah, there's that. Also against a nil, deal with their board, okay? Um, it is very important that you deal with their board because if you go for game and they have these two cards in life right here or any version of cards like Sanji or anything that stalls, even Amaru is a, is a, you know, is a life gain. If they have any version that stalls, then Brule and Gang Beige will basically prevent you from going for game. And if they have multiple characters on the field like Yamato and Gadatsu and Charlotte Linlin, then all of your characters that turn sideways right here probably minus the Kaido, are going to get wiped. You know, with Yamato, one Dawn on it swings perfectly into the Borsalino for 2,000 over, making you discard two cards to save it. With no Dawn on it, Charlotte Linlin right here swings perfectly into Rob Lucci, making you discard two cards to save it. And the reason that you go for board over uh, going for life is because if you are unsuccessful in your attempt to, to, uh, to go for game, then you'll never get the opportunity again because if they clear your board, you're not going to have enough pressure, literally, not enough t attacks on your board to be able to deal with the life gain as uh, a leader effect from Manel as well as potential triggers. I always say my favorite thing to do is to go for lethal when they have two life and you have at least four characters that are moderately big on the board. It's easier said than done though, because every character you have, except for this 10 cost Kaido right here, is within range of getting dealt with in an efficient way. Borsalino is easily killed by Yamato attacking into it, or Katakuri putting it at the bottom or top of your life. Rob Lucci is easily killed by attacking into it. Same with Hina, right? So all of these cards, you only really have one shot to go for lethal. And if they have a big board that can just wipe your board or kill two of them, then the following turn, you're not going to have enough value and not enough bodies on the board to realistically put together a plan of attack at efficient numbers that is likely to pierce into their life. So there is a Nell for you in the mirror match, okay? These are the most important cards. They are Borsalino, Hina, Kaido, Rebecca. I forgot to add one, I am sorry guys, and it is Houndblaze. Houndblaze right here. These are your most important cards. Obviously you wanna see your cost reduction as well, but you know, it, for the sake of the video, like I can't put the entire deck on there, right? Because it's obviously in combination with each other, but you need to see these cards right here. And the reason you need to see them is because the, the the Sakazuki mirror match just comes down to who can Luchi the other person as many times as possible and who can keep a big body on the board. And obviously, most of the time you're just trading back and forth. You're playing Rebecca Hina and then you're popping with Luchi and then they're playing Rebecca Hina and then popping with Luchi. And then sometimes you get a little cute and throw a little Sabo in there so you stall a turn. But, you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. What these cards do, um, obviously, is help you fight for board right? And then obviously make your opponent waste cards dealing with them. But also, um, more specifically, more importantly, Kaido, the 10 cost, if you can play this safely at two life, which is my favorite time to play it, then you pretty much just win the game right then and there unless they draw into a bunch of cards with like Sanji's Pilaf or Kaido. And uh, for that reason, um, you draw four cards off Kaido, which obviously can be Rebecca, Houndblaze, Sabo, and Luchi, the most important cards in the mirror, right? They could realistically be that. They could be counters. They could be a lot of things. What what What's most important is they usually have to overextend pretty severely to deal with the Kaido. It's a 10 cost, which means you need a Hina, you need an Ice Age, and you need a Houndblaze, which is a three-card combo. Now, obviously, it's much easier to keep Kaido on the board if they have less cards in hand. Usually you only play Kaido when they're running low on cards, for example, anywhere from four to five, or if you have two life just because it's pretty much free to use it, right? Now, obviously you have to make sure they're at three or less life, but that's relatively easy to do, especially with Sakazuki, because you only have to do one life in five turns. So relatively easy to do. So um, 
Once this Kaido comes out, you draw four cards and you have a lot of answers to what they are going to do. You also have more counters than they are going to have, especially um, if you're playing 10 2Ks like I'm playing 10 2Ks. So with that being said, we'll talk about some general tips. In the mirror match, you can bottom deck these as bottom deck the Hina as much as humanly possible. Bottom deck the opposing Hina, not your own. So by doing this, when they play their Rebecca plays, they do not have a target that is as impactful as Hina, right? Now, obviously, they play anywhere from three to four, so they're going to see probably more than one or two of these, or probably more than one of these. But ideally, if they only see one, you got to make it count by bottom decking it when they play it. When you do that, it prevents them from getting very efficient Rebecca plays, all right? Um, I'll also... You know, Hina is a 5k attacker, so, you know, you don't want that swinging into your life. So if you can bottom deck it, that'd be great. If you have the option of either killing Hina by battle or Luchi by battle, kill the Luchi every single time and then bottom deck the Hina just because it is much better. Obviously, Luchi is more uh, easily recurred. However, you know, um, cost reduction is harder to come by um, than KO cards. For example, uh, we are playing uh, Hina. We are playing... Uh, Ice Age, and we are playing Great Eruption. Other than that, there's almost no cost reduction. So if you don't, so if you don't have Hina, you're taking away a third of their deck for cost reduction plays, and they're only going to be able to KO a one or a two, or with leader effect, a, a you know, a, 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 a one and a one, right? Or I'm sorry, a three, a three and a, and a one, which isn't nearly as good without the cost reduction. So this is the cost reduction. If you can take it away as much as possible, your Hound Blaze. Don't waste it on stupid stuff. So, if they have a brand new and nothing else, you don't need to kill the brand new with the Hound Blaze. All right? That's just stupid. It's a waste of resources. Wait for something important to come up like a Hina, like a Borsalino blocker, like a Luchi, any, anything other than, than brand new. Right? Or or the other, the three cost Hina. Don't even waste it on that. Um, kill it by battle. That being said... This card, as well as the three cost Hina, which I forgot to add on here, but it's this Hina, except it's blue. The blue Hina, make sure that you kill them by battle. And the reason you kill these by battle is because they can ping you for 5k or 7k all the time. And by, by that, I mean with their Hound Blazes, usually they, they have to attack with their leader first to be able to use their Hound Blaze efficiently, and then they give that Dawn to the brand new. However, if they attacked with their leader first to cost minus something to put it in Hound Blaze range, and they don't have any other character on the board, then the Hound Blaze is essentially the second part of its effect, or I'm sorry, technically the first part of its effect, goes to waste because they don't have a little character to give it to. So when you kill these Hinas and brand news by battle, the blue Hina, again, like I said, the three, four blue Hina, when you kill them by battle, they do not have characters to boost up. And then they also, on turns where they have extra Dawn, they can't just go five at life, five at life with like their little tiny characters. Because again, you don't have that much counter in hand and you don't want to waste it on their stupid little attacks. So attack into them when you can, please. Now we'll talk about Whitebeard. Draw 2Ks or blockers or you die. Oh, and also attack for 8K a lot. That's it. That's that's the answer right there. Not, not, not too much to explain. So, I talked for 33 minutes on the... on how to win with Sakazuki, how to play Sakazuki. I think this video has been great. I spent a lot of time on this video. So if you guys are interested, please feel free to give it a like. Subscribe to the channel. That would be fantastic. Um, be sure to join our Discord if you want to talk more. We have a massive community on there. I think we have over a thousand members now and we are pretty active. However, we're not like crazy. So there's not like just a thousand things going on. It's just a fun discord. It's kind of low key. We have some jokes on there. It's a blast. Thanks for everyone that's in it already. If you're interested in it in the future, um, feel free to join below. The link's going to be in the description. Um, like I said, the thing that loses you the most games is your own deck and your own misplays. So um, if you Try to make it as consistent as possible, you know, especially with the version that I just showed you guys early in the video, as well as, you know, playing optimally and making the right decisions, then it's much harder to lose games um, 
than than normal. However, you still will, will lose games. It's just that simple, right? No one no one can be undefeated all the time, right? So, yeah, guys, that that's the end of the video. Um, I'll see you guys in my next video. Peace.